changing the course of things, pushing back evil, advancing good, and making a difference. That's what heroes do. And when you look around long enough, and if you listen long enough, and if you scroll through social media long enough, or watch the news long enough, or listen to leaders long enough, it's pretty blatantly clear from where I sit that heroes are what we desperately need in this hour where we find ourselves living. That's why we're doing this series, because we need people like you to decide to be a hero in your generation. You have the capacity to be a hero. That's what we're talking about throughout this series. In week one, we talked about a hero. His name was Barnabas, and he leveraged a superpower. It doesn't seem much like a superpower. It's a bit undramatic, but he leveraged a superpower called encouragement. And because he decided to be an encourager, uh, he became a hero. Last week, uh, we talked about Amos, who used his superpower of advocacy. He became an advocate for the most vulnerable, the powerless, the voiceless, and when he did so, he became a hero in his generation. Today, I wanna to talk about another hero, and this, this hero we find in the Old Testament, uh, he's not usually on our list of heroes because there's really nothing miraculous that he did, and really when you look at his life, there's really no metric system that you can point to and say, hey, look there, there's a real success. But I wanna to talk to uh, you about him because he has been uh, walking with me for about the past 10 or 12 weeks. I can't get him out of my head. I can't get his writings out of my head. And hopefully after today, you'll spend some time thinking about his life as well. I wanna talk about the horse runner from Anathoth. And uh, this horse runner, and you'll find out who he is in just a moment, and maybe some of you already know who he is, uh, but his dad was a guy by the name of Hilkiah. Uh, he was a priest, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, Hilkiah and Miss Hilkiah, his wife, uh, they had a son during some of the darkest days in all of Israel's history. And their son became one of the few bright spots during that very dark time. Uh, their son was born, and these parents, this mom, this dad, they had the difficult responsibility, the challenging responsibility, but yet exciting responsibility of doing what all parents have had to do at some point and moment in time, and that's to name their child. Now, I have met some people, and after they introduced themselves to me and told me their name, it became evident, evident to me that not all parents take this responsibility seriously. Uh, but this is a responsibility that all parents should take, you know, with uh, some seriousness. They should care about naming their child because you don't want to name your child something and then years later, every time they meet somebody, you know, that somebody walks off and they think to themselves, what did this kid's parents have against them? Why did they hate them from the very beginning of their life? What were they thinking giving this kid, this person, this man, this woman their name? Well, naming someone is important, but naming in those days, naming in the days of Hilkiah and his wife, uh, when you named a son or a daughter, it was a big deal. It was a bigger deal than most of our generation thinks about when we name our sons and daughters. Because when you named a son or a daughter, it was just not about their name, it was about their future. It, it was a way of casting vision for the future over their life. It, it was a way of saying, this is what we hope and pray you live up to. It, it was as one writer said, this is pulling a lever of hope for the future. It was a big deal. Now, I remember when our two sons were born and you know, leading up to their birth, Allison and I, we, we talked about what, what, are you, what are we gonna name him? What are we gonna name him? And, so when Shepherd, our firstborn, uh, when he came along and we had settled on the name Shepherd, uh, it was because of my love for King David. And it was also my love for Jesus who said, I am the good shepherd. But, but it was really the story of David. He was tender, but tenacious. Uh, he took down bears and lions, so he's a tough guy. You know, he uh, slayed Goliath and he was a man after God's own heart. And, and from the moment that Shepherd was born, we, we spoke those things over his life and said, this is what your name is connected to. And so we, we felt, it was really important uh, to name him something that we could cast a vision over his life. And then when Grace and James came along, uh, James being the half-brother of Jesus, one of the great stories in the New Testament, also the one who stood up in the book of Acts and said, let's, let's not make it hard, let's not make it difficult 
for people who want to turn to faith in Christ. Uh, he was a great contributor to the early church, a leader, a pastor in the early church, and also it was the name of one of Allison's grandfathers. And so we speak over him the things about James, both, both his grandfather and the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, what we did, we, 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 just, uh, we just took our cues from other men and women in history who did the same. Hilkiah and his wife, that's exactly what they did when they named their son. Now, when they named their son, their son's name means to the Lord lifts or the Lord hurls. Scholars are a little bit at odds about which one it is, but, but either way, the Lord is in his name. They had a vision that God was gonna lift this son up above the muck and the mire, above the mediocrity of his day, and that God was gonna use their son to make a difference. Or God was just gonna pick up their son and just throw him into the culture of his day and just blow it up and make something better of it. So they sat down and they said, what are we going to call our son? And they spoke his name. His name would be remembered among one of the great prophets of Israel, one of the major prophets, his name, Jeremiah. And this is how his book begins. These are the words of Jeremiah. The Lord lifts or the Lord hurls. These are the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Now, to tell you a little bit of Jeremiah's story, because I think it's important, Jeremiah was born during the reign of King Manasseh. Now, if you have heard that name before, or you've read any of the Old Testament, or just heard people talk about him, uh, you may know that he was one of the most wicked kings in the history of the nation of Israel. He ruled 55 years, and in 55 years, Years, you can accumulate a lot of evil deeds. And Manasseh, he was able to do just that. He took over after his father Hezekiah died. And the thing about Manasseh was he embraced pagan theology. Uh, and if you think about pagan theology, you could also call it false theology. Uh, you could also call it untrue theology, uh, whatever you wanna label it, but it was pagan theology, theology that he borrowed from the pagan religions of the nations that surrounded Israel. Now, here's the thing that I want you to just jot down if you take some notes, put it in your phone, write it in your Bible. Here's something you need to know about pagan theology. Whenever there is a pagan theology at work, a false theology, a theology that is not rooted in truth, things go off the rails in the context of women, children, certain ethnic people, certain groups of people, they always end up getting mistreated. Whenever you find a bad theology, you find certain people paying the price for it. And throughout the Old Testament, and even as the New Testament opens, you find that whenever there is untrue theology, uh, you find that people, certain people, not all people, but certain people always pay the price, usually women and children. In 2 Kings 21, Manasseh, he had embraced this theology uh, to such an extent, uh, he just, he, he did something that many of us could never even imagine. He sacrificed his own son on a pagan altar to the, to the pagan god Moloch. And again, I'll point out because this is a thread throughout the scripture, uh, wherever there is false theology, pagan theology, children become expendable, women become expendable, the powerless become expendable. It's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, and guess what? It's throughout history. And we can see it even in our culture today. That's why even the Old Testament scriptures are so relevant because what we see happening in the lives of men and women, children, in the old days that we call the Old Testament, we still see those things very much at work today. So Manasseh had set up pagan worship all over the land of Israel, including in the very temple that Solomon had built. Uh, it says in 2 Kings 21 as well that innocent blood filled Jerusalem at the hands of Manasseh. So death, mistreatment, paganism, it all went along with the 55 years of Manasseh's rule. When he died, his son Ammon took over and he only ruled two years before he was assassinated. When he was assassinated, his son took over. Think about this for a moment. His eight-year-old son ascended to the throne, his son Josiah. So eight years old, he becomes king. Now just think for a moment. I've got a seven-year-old son and I've got a nine-year-old son. Think about your eight-year-old or my eight-year-old or any eight-year-old being king over anything. Well, Josiah, he became king, and we're told the most amazing story about this young king. At 16, he began to seek the God of his ancestors, 
at 20, he started removing the shrines of paganism in most of the land. At 26, he began to repair the temple because the temple had fallen into disrepair because of all the pagan worship activity. At 26, something interesting happens. We're told in the book of Chronicles and Kings that Hilkiah the priest, and many folks believe, many scholars believe that this Hilkiah is the father of Jeremiah, that Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of God because the law of God had been lost. And anytime truth is lost, mark it down. You can read it in the Old Testament. When truth is lost, you can see it in Manasseh's life. When truth is lost, love is lost as well. But when the law of God was found, because it had been lost for some time, it began to be the catalyst for a great revival. Josiah began to enact reforms against paganism and began to restore worship the way that the Torah had been, instru- had been given to the nation of Israel and had instructed them in the ways of how they were to serve and obey and worship God. And so Josiah's reforms eradicated idolatry from the landscape of Israel, but his reforms were unable to take idolatry out of the people's hearts. And this was the world that Jeremiah stepped into. There was the appearance of religion. There was the appearance of worship, but idolatry was still so connected and embedded in the people's hearts and mind. And so it goes on in verse two, and it says, the Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. The Lord's message continued throughout the reign of King Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, until the 11th year of the reign of King Zedekiah, another one of Josiah's sons. The days that Jeremiah lived in could be characterized this way. Truth had been compromised and love had become conditional. These two things always travel together. Whenever truth is compromised, love becomes conditional. Whenever truth is compromised, love becomes conditional. The truth of God had been compromised and love for people had become conditional. Whenever someone believes something untrue, I promise you this is true, someone always gets unloved. Whenever someone believes something untrue, someone experiences being unloved, usually the vulnerable, the powerless, women, children, certain groups of people. We see it happening throughout the entire era of Jeremiah's life. People are using God as a commodity to legitimize their desires, their agenda, uh, their seeking of pleasure. Uh, They're using God as a puppet on a string and whenever they want to invoke God to justify whatever it is that they wanna do, they invoke the name of God, but otherwise they really don't care. People were pledging allegiance to any belief system which would accommodate whatever behavior they wanted for their lives. Think about that because it wasn't new then and it's not new now. People love to believe what allows them to behave the way they want to behave. It's tempting, it's easy, it's alluring, it's seductive to say, yeah, this is what I believe, this is what I wanna believe, this is what seems true to me as long as it allows me to behave and to act and to think the way that I want to act and to think. And so they are pledging allegiance to any belief system that allows them uh, to have a behavior that they so desire. And Jeremiah, when he's 17 years old, he's been raised in all of this. He's a teenager during all of this. But when he was 17 years old, he had an encounter with God. And it says this, He says, the Lord gave me this message. This is Jeremiah telling us about his experience with God. And this is what God said to Jeremiah when he was 17. He said, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Jeremiah's heroic story begins with purpose. That's where heroism always begins. It begins with purpose. Jeremiah, God says, you are no accident. You're not incidental, you're not insignificant. I made you on purpose. I made you who you are. You are, as the psalmist said, fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. You are not a carbon copy of anyone or anything. You are you, Jeremiah. And your identity and your value and your worth, it was established way before you were born. Because before you were born, I knew you. I created you. You are part of my purpose. You're a part of my plan. I have set you apart. Listen to this phrase. I set you apart. I have put you aside for a specific purpose. 
I've put you in a place, Jeremiah, that only you can stand. I've given you a lane to run in that only you can run in. I've given you a job that only you can do, a role that only you can play. I have set you apart, Jeremiah, to be who only you can be, to do what only you can do. Jeremiah, listen to me, listen to me. God says, that's how important you are to me. I have set you apart to do something that only you can do. Now, if being a hero begins with a sense of purpose like that, Think about if you and I could wake up every day knowing and believing just that because Jeremiah doesn't have the market on God knowing him before he was born. Jeremiah does not have the market cornered as it relates to God setting people aside for a specific role and purpose. What if you woke up every day believing with all of your heart that God has set you aside, that God has given you a place to stand that only you can stand? That God has given you a lane to run in that only you can run in. That God has given you a job to do that only you can do. A role to play that only you can play. That you are a character in God's story and you are only one character and no one can play your character but you. Imagine if you woke up every single day believing that, knowing that. What if you laid your head on the pillow every single day, knowing that and believing that? Can you imagine the life that would come alive inside of you? The sense of responsibility, the sense of awe that God has set me apart. He has set you apart to be heroes in our generation. Now, here's the honest thing. We don't wake up like that most days. We don't lay down at the, end of the, at the end of a long day feeling like that most days. Jeremiah didn't even feel that way. He, he, he protested a bit. He said, oh, sovereign, oh, sovereign Lord. He said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. I can't speak for you. I'm too young. Jeremiah, he felt like the way most of us feel when we start talking about doing the heroic thing or being a heroic man or being a heroic woman or a heroic student. He, he felt the way most of us do. He felt inadequate. What can I do? Who am I to be a hero? Who am I to make a difference? I'm too old, I'm too young, or I'm, I'm not enough of this, I'm not enough of that, I'm too much of this, I'm too much of that, I'm not smart enough, I'm not gifted enough, I, I don't know enough, I'm not experienced enough, I, I don't have enough wealth, I don't have enough connections, I, I don't have the career that I need, I don't have, and we just push back and push back and push back and give God all the reasons that he can't use us to be heroes when God is saying to you, I set you apart to do the thing that only you can do before you were ever born. And Jeremiah says, God, what can I do? I'm just a boy. I'm too young. I can't speak for you. And God said, well, let, me tell you what I, let me tell you what I'm gonna do, Jeremiah. Today, I appoint you, just you. I appoint you to stand up against nations. <laughs> Jeremiah, you one man are gonna stand up against nations and kingdoms. Doesn't that sound fun? Doesn't that sound intimidating? Wouldn't you feel inadequate? I'm gonna appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. He says, Jeremiah, you've got a tough task. It's not gonna be easy. You're not gonna be popular, but this is what I have set you apart to do. You're not gonna be on the front of a magazine you're not even really gonna be celebrated, Jeremiah, but I've set you apart for this because judgment's coming. And God goes on and says to Jeremiah, listen, I am calling the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem. And every time I hear that, a chill goes down my spine. God says, I am, I am presently right now, Jeremiah, I am calling in judgment against my people. They're coming from the north. I, the Lord, have spoken and judgment's on its way. He goes on, he says, I will pronounce judgment on my people for all of their evil, for deserting me and burning incense to other gods. Yes, they will worship idols because they make idols made with their own hands. Think about that. How, how, think about just how much nonsense to worship an idol that you created with your own hands. Why would anybody worship an idol that they created with their own hands? Because you know that the creation is inferior to you because it is a reality because of your energy. It is a reality because of your creativity, because of your energy in life. Why would anybody worship the work of their own hand? Because when you worship idols made with your own hands, it is a reflection of you and you're actually worshiping yourself. 
He says, Jeremiah, you're living in a generation where people, when all of the stuff is pulled aside, and when we look behind the curtain, what we really find is a generation of people who are worshiping themselves. And so he tells Jeremiah, he says, you gotta get ready. I've got a message for you. You've gotta tell the people, don't be afraid of them. You've gotta speak up. It's not gonna be easy, but it's necessary. But don't worry, Jeremiah. And then God bucks him up, and I love this. Today, right now, this moment, I have made you a fortified city an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah and its officials, its priests and the people of the land because Jeremiah, they're gonna come against you. They will fight against you. They're not gonna celebrate you. They're gonna hate you. They're gonna come against you, but they will not overcome you, Jeremiah, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. You are like a city that cannot be captured. You are untouchable, immovable, invincible. Listen to me, Jeremiah. They can't touch you until my purpose for you has been fulfilled. Imagine that, imagine the confidence. Imagine if we could just hear God whisper to us to say, no one and no thing can touch you until you have served out my purpose in your generation. So don't be afraid because they can't touch you. They can't hurt you until you have lived out your purpose for your time in history. And that's what God says to Jeremiah. So he begins to preach. And it's a tough message. It's not an easy message to listen to. It's not a, I'm sure it wasn't an easy message to preach. In chapter two, here's a little bit of his sermon. He says, this is what the Lord says. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? God said, how have I offended you? How have I let you down? They worshiped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves because you become like what you worship. And Jeremiah says, what your ancestors did you are doing the very same thing. You have become enslaved to lies, to your desires, to the pursuit of pleasure at the cost of other people and even yourself. He doesn't let up. He says, for my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. He says, you left fresh water and now you're out here drinking from stagnant water holes. You left life for death. You've left blessing for cursing. You've left safety for destruction. You had water that was endless in supply, but you went out and dug your own hole looking for water in a hole that will never hold water to begin with. You're chasing satisfaction. You're chasing pleasure. But you're never going to find neither of those. And the problem was, it wasn't that they didn't know truth because Jeremiah goes on to say, you yourselves have killed your prophets as lying kills its prey. He says, you have an intolerance for the truth. You always have, because whenever someone confronts you with truth that's uncomfortable, whenever someone confronts you with truth that causes you to change the way that you're living or adjust the way that you're thinking or to alter the way that you treat yourself and treat other people, you have an intolerance for truth. You want your own version of the truth that allows you to do what you want to do, to treat people the way that you want to treat them, to talk about them the way that you want to talk about them. You have an intolerance for the truth. I think it sounds a bit like our generation. I think the greatest intolerance of our day is an intolerance for the truth. Everybody wants a little piece of the truth, but they don't want the whole truth and nothing but the truth because that type of truth is uncomfortable. That type of truth demands change. That type of truth says, there's some things about me that's not right. There's some things about me that needs to change. There's some things about you that needs to be changed. And we don't like that. And so we're just a bit intolerant, not of all the truth, but just the truth that we don't like. Why won't they listen to the truth? Well, listen to what Jeremiah says next. He says, oh, my people, listen to the words of the Lord. Have I been like a desert to Israel? Have I been to them a land of darkness? Is, have I not been good to you? Have I been oppressing you? And then listen to these words. Why then do my people say, at last we are free from God. We don't need him anymore. That's what they had wanted for generations, to be free from the yoke of God, to be free from the chains of obedience, to be free from the law, to be free from God's ethic, to be free from his commandments. They said, at last, we have found theology, we have found you know, a belief system, we have sophistication, we have evolved, we have advanced, we have come to the place, we don't need God anymore. And whenever a culture theirs or ours loses an awareness or a consciousness 
of God. As we lose God, we also begin to lose truth, love, justice, compassion, mercy, and grace. Because the standard of all of those th things are found in a reality of God. And so they said, we're free. And those things were on the way out the door. And so Jeremiah keeps on preaching and we find him brokenhearted and we find him crying. In chapter seven, he's at the temple and he says, stop mistreating people. Stop exploiting the vulnerable. Stop worshiping idols. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting others as you do it. He says, you're destroying your families. You can't see how you're hurting yourself and hurting each other. You're blind to the path that you're heading down. You're heading towards what you think you want, but when you catch what you think you want, when you've got what you want, you're gonna discover it's not what you wanted after all. And so Jeremiah, because he became known as the weeping prophet, we find him crying his eyes out. The people won't listen. He's brokenhearted over the brokenness of his people. He sees his people breaking the law of God and it breaks his heart. And so by the time we get to chapter 12, by the time we get to chapter 12 in Jeremiah, I just wanna read you a few of these verses. In Jeremiah chapter 12, Jeremiah's a bit cynical. Jeremiah's a little bit upset. He, he's a little bit angry and he's wanting to complain. He's wanting to complain to God. So I just wanna read you a little bit of his complaint in Jeremiah chapter 12 because he's not superhuman, he's like us. He's like a lot of us after we watch the news and scroll through Facebook or scroll through Twitter. We walk away feeling a bit cynical that nothing's gonna change, nothing's gonna get better. We walk away being a bit angry on the inside. We walk away complaining to our families, complaining to our children, complaining maybe even to God. Listen to what Jeremiah, he says, God, why are the wicked so prosperous? He said, why are the people who seem to be sinning the most, why do they seem to be blessed the most? He says, this just ticks me off. It does me good to know that people like Jeremiah got ticked off. Why are evil people so happy? He says, here I am trying to serve you and I'm as miserable. I'm crying, I'm brokenhearted, I'm discouraged. I look around, I'm a bit depressed, but boy, look at all of those people out there. They look like they're having the time of their life. And then he blames God. He says, you planted them and they've taken root and they've prospered. Your name is on their lips, but you are far from their hearts. God, they're using you and you don't seem to care. And then, <laughs> and then listen to this. He says, so drag these people away like sheep to be butchered. You ever felt like that? You ever got so angry, so cynical, looking at a generation, looking at what goes on around you and say, God, just, just kill them. <laughs> That's where Jeremiah's, I think he's in a bad place. He said, God, just kill them, just butcher them, set them aside to be slaughtered. The world would be better off without them. That's where he's at. He's in a bad place. He's not in a good place. This isn't godly talk from the prophet Jeremiah. This is not representing the heart of God brought to us by the prophet Jeremiah. No, this is, this is a behind the scenes. This is back there in the water cooler. This is back there in the back room under the bed in the closet talk. God, let's just kill them. That's what I'd like to see happen. How long are we gonna let this go on? And then God speaks back to Jeremiah and asks him a question I love. He says, okay, Jeremiah, if racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? If you stumble and fall on open ground, what will you do in the thickets near the Jordan? Or as the NIV puts it, if you've, ra if you've raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? Jeremiah, I know it's easy to quit. It's easy to walk away, sit out, check out of the game, not care, get angry, get bitter, spout out. Blame, point, fingers. I know it's easy to do all of that. But if you're gonna trip up over just what you've been through already, how are you gonna run with the horses? How are, you gonna, how are you gonna stay in the game when it gets tough, tougher than it already is? See, his enthusiasm had become a victim to his experience. And so this is what Jordan, Pe not Jordan Peterson, but Eugene Peterson, Eugene Peterson, he said this about the prophet Jeremiah. And this is how he put this whole little scene as we wrap it up. He says, life is difficult, Jeremiah. So are you gonna quit at the first wave of opposition? 
Are you going to retreat when you find that there's more to life than finding three meals a day and a dry place to sleep at night? Are you going to run home the moment that you find that the mass of men and women are more interested in keeping their feet warm than living for the glory of God? Are you going to live cautiously or courageously? I called you to live at your best, to pursue righteousness, to sustain a drive toward excellence. It is easy, I know, to be neurotic. It is easier to be parasitic. It is easier to relax in the embracing arms of the average. Easier, but not better. Easier, but not more significant. Easier, but not more fulfilling. I called you to a life of purpose far beyond what you think yourself capable of living. And I promise you adequate strength to fulfill your destiny, Jeremiah. Now at the first sign of difficulty, you're ready to quit. If you are fatigued by this run-of-the-mill crowd of apathetic mediocrities, what, you, what will you do when the real race begins? The race with the swift and determined horses. What is it that you really want, Jeremiah? Do you want to shuffle along with this crowd or do you want to run with the horses? And Jeremiah decided that he was gonna spend his life running with the horses. He gets towards the end of his ministry and this is what he says. He says, for 23 years, from the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until now, the Lord has been giving me his messages. I have faithfully passed them on to you, but you have not listened. 23 years, and nobody cared about what Jeremiah had to say. Do you know what Jeremiah's superpower was? Courageous endurance. 23 years and it seemed as if his ministry didn't count. 23 years and it seemed as though he was doing no good. 23 years and he didn't seem at all as though he was a success. He couldn't point to anybody to say, look, there's a convert, there's someone who responded and signed a card. For 23 years, nothing. Through some of the most chaotic and violent days of his nation's history, Jeremiah, Except for 23 years, it's like no one's listening. But he didn't quit. And he didn't give in to cynicism. He didn't give in to fear. He didn't give in to anger. He didn't give in to mediocrity. He didn't give in to average or apathy or idolatry. He, he didn't give in to disobedience. He decided he was gonna run his race. He decided that he was gonna run with horses. He wasn't gonna quit when the going got tough. He wasn't gonna quit even when people didn't listen. He didn't run away from real life. He ran. He ran headlong into real life. Lots of times he's inwardly full of agony, but he never swayed from his purpose. He believed that God had a plan, that he was part of it, so he could not quit. So let me say to you today from the life of Jeremiah, God has a plan and you are part of it. Don't quit. Don't give in. I know that these are not easy days to live in, but don't quit. Don't give in, don't give up. Don't become cynical. Don't become a pessimist. Don't become a non-believer. Don't believe that the best is yet to come. Believe that the best is yet to come because God has promised us so. Don't quit, most of all during these days, speaking truth and showing love because that's what we need right now. We need heroes to speak truth. We need heroes to show love to not give up one or the other, but to hold on for dear life to both of those things. We need men and women and students to speak and stand and live for truth. And we need men and women and students to decide that they're gonna show love, the unconditional, undeserved, unchanging, unending love of God to every single person. That was Jeremiah's legacy. A man who spoke truth and a man who showed unconditional love. Did he have his moments? Oh, he had his moments. But when push came to shove, truth and love, that was the legacy of Jeremiah. May it be ours as well. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, give us courage to endure, to not quit, to not give in, to not check out, to not give in to the pressure of our culture to not give in to the pressures of anger as we see things and hear things that infuriate us to the very core of who we are. 
Give us the courage to endure like Jeremiah, even when it seems as as though things aren't working out the way that we want them to work out, that we are gonna stay the course because we believe that you have a plan, you have a purpose, we're part of it, so we're not gonna quit because we know that your story does not end with our lives. Your story is bigger than our lives, so God, help us not to quit. You've set us apart to be who only we can be and to do what only we can do. Help us all to have courage to endure so that we can run like Jeremiah with the horses. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am so thrilled that you've decided to be with us today for the Creek Church Online. I hope that you took a moment to share today's broadcast with one of your friends or some of your family. Keep in mind that our broadcast will continue to air throughout Sunday and even throughout the week. You can go to thecreekchurch.com for times, and then you can take a moment to invite someone to watch as well. Again, I really appreciate you being with us. Many of you, most of you perhaps, you call the Creek Church your church, and I know you're like me. You miss being able to gather together. I'm standing here in the auditorium, empty seats. But I want you to know, even though our seats are empty and our building is empty, our church continues to be the church. Uh, You are there, you're watching with friends, watching with family. Many of you, you're going back to work. Uh, You're in your community. You are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. So the church continues to move and the church continues to be the body of Christ where we are. So I just wanna thank you uh, for being so patient during this season. And I wanna thank you for being so generous during this season. If you haven't given today, you can take a moment and give just now. You can follow the directions that are there on the screen. It's safe, it's easy, and your generosity will indeed change lives. I want you to pay attention this week to our social media accounts because uh, we are gonna begin to announce our preliminary plan about reopening. So I know that you'll want to stay tuned for that. And I know that many of you will be excited that that's out there on the horizon. And we're looking forward to the day when we will be able to meet in an in-person gathering together. But in the meantime, continue to share what we're doing online digitally and continue to participate in your local church in any way you can. I want you to know that I love you and I miss you and I can't wait to see you sometime, hopefully in the near future. Have a great day.